Oh, it says I can't do it. <clears throat> well, I'll definitely send it to you. Yeah, that's no problem. Okay. Launch Lab Online. Happy Wednesday evening. We are here for an episode of The Breakdown, powered by MetLife. I'm Liz Marion, your host and the Launch Lab Online Community Manager. And today I am joined by Deshaun Russell, the founder and CEO of Southern Elegance Candle Company. Deshaun, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you. I am so excited to be here. So, you know, so give us a little bit of an introduction um, to you, to your, your military affiliation, um, a little bit about that and who you are and, and what you were doing before you became an entrepreneur. So my name is Deshaun Russell. I am the owner of Southern Elegance Candle Company. We make Southern inspired home fragrance products. Um, at the moment, we're looking to expand that um, product category in 2020. And I am a military spouse. I have been uh, married to um, my, well, I was married to my um, ex-husband for 22 years. Um, to 17 of that, I believe, was um, during his time in the military. So he just kind of recently retired um, and traveled all over, um, following him, trying to create a career and a life around the usual moving every three to four years, um, which can be incredibly difficult. Um, and the whole time that we were traveling, like the company is really created around those travels because I always wanted to come back home. So I'm a Southern girl at heart. I'm a true Southern bill. I love the South. My whole family is from the South. And uh, when we finally settled, like I created a whole company based on me wanting to come back home. And that's basically how the um, company got started. I was working as a, um, well, actually, so I'm a, I'm a simplify the story. I worked in education. I've worked as a teacher, a teacher coach, an administrator. I was working on my doctorate at one point in time because I just knew that I was going to be like a principal and I was just going to be this fabulous superintendent of schools one day. And the closer I got to the top, the more I hated it. And literally I walked into work one day and I looked around and I was like, I hate this place. I hate this job. I hate these people. Uh, I can't take it no more. And I quit. And everybody, this is like 22 years in education. Um, I think I was going through a midlife crisis. I was like 45. So I was just like, I'm, I got 40 good years left and I'm not going to spend it coming in no doggone classroom and working with these kids and they crazy, they mumbles. So I just quit. And everybody was like, what are you going to do? And I was like, I think I'm going to start my own company. And they were like, you know, nothing about any of that. And I was like, I, if I can learn calculus, I can learn how to do stuff. And I just quit my job and I started my company and that's what happened. And you started Southern Elegance Candle Company. And so can you give us a little bit of background of exactly what the company encompasses and how long have you been in business? So right now we basically do um, candle. So when, let me say this. So when I started, it was like a whole bunch of random stuff. I did soap, sugar scrubs, body butters, candles, oils. I mean, like all of this random kind of stuff. And then when I really, really got serious, I said, okay, number one, this is just like too much to manage as a company, especially like something that I didn't know what I was doing. So I was like, I want to just be honest. I said, which one of these things can I make the most money off of? Like which one of these can I charge the absolute most money for? And so with candles, if you position yourself as a, it really depends on how you position yourself. So I said, we're going to go with candles and I'm going to charge um, the most money uh, that I can possibly get for these candles. And that's how I ended up doing candles and i forgot the rest of the question because too many people never charge enough money and they do too much stuff when they do product based what was the other part of the question yeah and we're definitely going to get into that so i'm glad you touched on that and actually so my other question was just how long you've been in business and four about years. that kind of journey so four years we've been in business four years and we're in, in about we've been sold in at least 400 stores we're probably in about 300 for sure Right now, a lot of grunt work, a lot of luck, a lot of praying kind of got me there. But when you're ready, people show up and then you're able to do things. But it's all about being ready to move into those um, different spaces. 
Well, and you know, something that, that I want to discuss with you, especially in this group, we do have a lot of product-based businesses, you know, and, and you mentioned this, that your company has actually changed quite a bit uh, and, and evolved. Um, and how has customer discovery uh, driven that a little bit? And, and I, I do want to get into kind of the B2B versus the B2C, but, um, but you know, how has the customer driven how you've changed and what are the challenges of being a product-based business literally with inventory okay so so there's two parts to your, your question about the customers and about the inventory because i want to hit on both of those number one you have to know who your people are so with my company it's kind of really easy because it's like people that live in the south or are from the south and so we built the whole company around southern living southern agriculture southern sense so for us, our people naturally gravitated to the brand. So out the gate, I established a very strong brand that's easily recognizable. And you know if the product is for you, you know it. There's no confusion when you show up and smell one of our candles and you read our story and you just know that this product is for you mainly because people always say, oh, this reminds me of my granddaddy, or this reminds me of my grandma, or when I was growing up, I had a magnolia tree, or I remember as a kid sucking honeysuckles, like, or we got pine trees in our backyard right now. This is how it smells outside. So you immediately know that the product is for you. So I created a product for a very specific group of people. So that brings me into the product. I only sell what my people like. I sell scents that I am not even a big fan of because I know my people like those. So I give them what they want. And in turn, they keep coming back to buy more and more because they're like, oh, I love your pine. Let me try the honeysuckle. I didn't really like the honeysuckle, but let me try the coastal waters. Oh, I love the coastal waters. So what you get is you start getting repeat customers because they know the brand, they feel connected to it, and they know that you're going to introduce something that really resonates with them. So by keeping everything all about my customer and knowing exactly who my customer is, that helps the company grow in two ways. Number one, because my people keep coming back. But number two, when stores see my brand, they see our story, they see our packaging, they know that their people are going to buy the product because we have the same end people in mind. So even though the, the B2B is a little bit different, the end result is the same person. So you got to make sure that you know who your people are, who are you selling to, why does your brand resonate with those people, and then give them more of what they want and less of what you think they want. I give my people sense that I know that they're going to love. Sometimes I ask them, you know, so you just got to make sure that you always know who are you selling to and why. I love those few points that you made specifically you know, and, and it all really resonates with me about the connection you have to your customer and how true to your brand you have been and what that brand um, and, and story brand is as well. Um, so can you also talk about, you know, coming to the realization of that messaging because it's such so personal for you, like you were saying, coming home, you know, and, and staying true to that from beginning to end. So from day one to now year four. You know, I think that when you when you're authentic about number one who you are like I tell people all the time I show up just like this all the time I don't care if it's a fancy meeting I don't care if it's a trade show I don't care if it's at work like I show up like this all the time so number one is very authentic so when you build when you build that kind of authenticity throughout your brand it's hard to to sway from it like when we're getting ready to introduce a new scent and we need a name for it. Like we already know what this brand is about. So it's hard not to um, be, I don't know. It's just so, when you know your brand and you know your people, it just keeps you like right here. You you know, this is where, this is the space that we need to exist in. When I see people, when I get advice from, oh, I better not, better not call nobody a Yankee, but uh, <laughs> just joking <laughs> when i get people from like outside of the south and they start telling me oh you need this kind of candle i just be like eh. i'm not even listening to that because i'm so focused on what i know to be true about me about our people and about the company so i don't you know like i said when it's when it's authentically 
built, you never have that issue. You really, you just never have that issue. Absolutely. When you don't you know, know what you're doing or you don't know who you're selling to. You're just kind of waffling all over the place. That's when you have that issue. Absolutely. And you know, us Southerners are, are transplanted everywhere. Um, <laughs> yep. You know, I, I love having my front porch scent in California. It reminds me of home for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what are some of the, you know, also with a product-based business, specifically, you know, with inventory and overhead costs, you know, what is different, do you think, uh, about having that, that it's a challenge for an entrepreneur, especially a first-time entrepreneur? Oh, I have made so many mistakes with that. Um, and I think that with a product-based business, it's going to take you a lot, not a lot longer to make money, but it's going to take you a little bit longer to make money than a service base, because I do carry inventory. Um and it's just a balancing act. I think the hardest thing is to make sure that you have enough money coming in to cover all of your expenses. So I have a bottom line number that I know that I have to have every single month to pay the bills, to order new supplies, to pay my employees, to pay taxes, to pay incidentals that you know, the website or whatever it is. So I have a bottom line number. And so that number, making sure that you are meeting the sales for that number every month can be difficult. And the more you scale, the bigger that number gets. So it's difficult to always have inventory. You know, one of the things that I'm learning is marketing is very important. And, and I don't know if it's, you know, as a Southerner or if it's as a woman, like I kind of shot away from buying, my, you know, telling people to buy my thing. Now I'm like, buy the freaking candles. Like I'm telling everybody all the time, I make candles, buy my candles, here's my website. We're coming up with a whole marketing calendar for um, 2020 where we are focusing on telling people to buy our candles. So making sure that you have a sales plan in place to make money and telling people that, you know, hey, this is a business and I need to make money and buy my stuff is like really, really important. It really is important. And can you can you touch on the the part of your story because this is going to kind of feed into the next thing that I want to ask you. Um, and, and maybe we should actually just lump this into one. So I want to talk to you about pitching and about exposure and growing in that way. And myself and everybody that attended the RDU Bunker Muster last year. Uh, got to see you pitch and pitch your story, but also the proof of the growth that you've experienced um, to those 400 stores. So can you talk about first, just the part of your story um, about the very beginning of making these candles and what that physically was like? And then, um, and then we can talk about, you know, pitching and what that's also done for your business. So, you know, I literally started with two pots in my kitchen working festivals. And um, so it went from two pots in my kitchen to four pots, the whole stove, to candles everywhere in the house, to half the garage, to the whole garage. And then it was winter. And my husband was like, listen, you got to get out of the garage. We moved into a rinky-dink little space. It was roach infested. It had used to be a restaurant, but it was the only thing available in the county. We outgrew that. Um, in about six months, we moved into a retail space. We had paper up on the window that just said, coming soon, Southern Elegance Candles, um, because we were actually manufacturing them. We weren't actually just kind of selling them. We just prayed every single day. Nobody would show up and kick us out because we weren't zoned for, you know, manufacturing. It was a retail space. Um, so it just, or it just kind of grew. And I, and I always go back to, it was just well-branded, not to kind of pat myself on the back, but because if it is well-branded, your people will find you and you will grow. The stores that cater to your people will find you and your brand will grow. So it grew very organically the first couple of years because it was just, when people saw it, they knew that it was for them and they would buy it. And that's just, that just really goes back to branding. I love, yeah. And I love how you keep coming back to that, you know, and that truth and authenticity that you've had with your brand. So let's talk about, you know, the growth of your company and how, you know, programs like uh, pitch competitions and bunker labs and your network 
And those things have helped you grow your business, um, you know, and, and, and to those 400 stores that you are now currently in. Oh man, listen, I cannot even put into words. Okay, first off, when I showed up at the pitch competition, I'm sure me and nobody else in there, when I first showed up, I'm sure nobody thought that I was gonna win. <clears throat> I was up against like people that were doing really, really, really dynamic things. So for me to show up, you know, this little girl with these little, you know, home candles and sprays and whatnot, you know, people were kind of like, what? Like, what is this? But then when I told the story, it didn't matter where people were from, they could relate to the story. It's a great product, like, but I tell anybody, it could be so, it doesn't, the product doesn't matter. It's the story that really just draws people in. And when I talk about my grandmother starting churches under, under trees, you know, back in the day, because, you know, she was black and a woman and where was she gonna, she couldn't go to the bank and get money. So she had just had to start the churches under the trees and she saved up her little pennies and nickels until she was able to get a plot of land and then she built churches. <clears throat> and that, and I grew up with my great grandmother and my grandmother, actually quite a few great grandmothers and um, grandmothers. So like, these are the people that nurtured me and you can really feel it in the brand. And when I talk about it, so when I told that story, everybody could think about their grandmother and how they love their grandmother. And I won. Now, I'm, I'm, I was just as shocked as everybody else. And I needed that $10,000 because I had to buy some boxes. And so it really helped. As a result of that, I got invited to go to Seattle and speak um, in Seattle. That event literally changed my life because I was in a room with people that were doing big things. Like I remember talking to some guy, uh, one of the guys that was sitting at my table and he was saying that, yeah, I'm gonna sell my company for a billion dollars. And I said, Who's, what did he say? Maybe he meant to say a million. And then he was like, yeah, my cut is gonna be 333 million. And I was just in there like, what? And then we were, they were doing the round, they were talking about fundraising and the lady on the stage, some dude threw out some outrageous number that he was trying to raise. And she was like, yeah, that's peanuts. You're not asking for enough money. And I was sitting there like, what? I'm thinking too small. Like my numbers are like really peanuts in comparison. And then it just changed like how I viewed the company and how I viewed my business and what I wanted out of life. And just like, it literally changed who I was as a person. Like I am so grateful. And then I participate in the CEO circle sponsored by Bunker Labs um, in a couple of counties over. We, you know, Hope County don't have anything here. So I drive to Raleigh once a, once a week to get that support throughout the year to keep that momentum going. So I can never kind of like get off course because I got to show up and talk to people about what I'm doing and what my plans are. And they want to know, are you following through with all of these things that you set up? So Bunker Labs has just been phenomenal in helping me shift from being a teacher to a entrepreneur, to a business owner. So I'm eternally grateful. And to a CEO as That's well. Right. <laughs> rich one day, y'all will be like, we remember her. I love that. I love that input though, of, you know, just to reiterate of being in a room with other entrepreneurs and how important that is and how that can change your perspective as well, you know, of what your company can be. Um, especially with a driving force like you behind it. Um, and can you talk about as well, because I know that in Seattle, we did speak about this a little bit, about diversifying your product line and the timeline for that, of not rushing things and developing things appropriately. And you've already spoken to this so much about staying authentic to the brand. Can you talk about those decisions and how they've kind of come to you in the last year for how to diversify the product line and your offerings as a company? So I always recommend that people start small. Make sure that people want your widget. Whatever your widget is, you got to really start with one thing. So we basically started with a mason jar candle. Then we said, okay, we, we can sell this. 
let's add another size. So we added another size candle. We didn't add another product. We just offered another size. Then that did well. And it was like, okay, well, let's add another candle. So then we had three sizes of candles at three different price points. We were like, okay, we, we pretty much covered the price range for candles. So now let's look at offering another product. So like the second year, we started offering wax melts because we could use the same wax in the candle as we use in the melt. So we didn't have to buy any additional equipment or anything. All we needed was a different packaging. And the packaging was relatively inexpensive. Um, and we tested it with just a few cents. Then we said, okay, people like this. So then we added that product. Then the following year, we added um, room sprays. Room sprays don't do that well. So we're kind of like, ah, are we going to keep them? We're going to give it another year. But every year we try to introduce something new to keep the brand fresh and to keep it within the realm of what we're doing. Having said that, we've established ourselves now as a Southern company, but like I said, being you know around people that think way bigger, we're now shifting our thinking from just being a candle company to a lifestyle brand. And let me say, a few months ago, I would have rolled my eyes at anybody that said anything about branding themselves or being a lifestyle brand, because it's so cliche. But if you do it correctly, like we literally are a lifestyle brand. So one of the things we're gonna introduce next year will be apparel, Southern themed apparel. So we're gonna start with t-shirts and we're gonna um, introduce some t-shirts. And then we may do a couple of baseball caps with the same kind of sayings on them that our t-shirts have. But all of this is still very Southern centric. So we gradually will introduce new products until we have a whole lifestyle. I'm going to be like the Black Martha Stewart, you know, of the South. So we're going to have a whole extensive line of products, um, but it's still going to be based off of what our people want, and we're only going to sell them what they want. Well, it's interesting, too, that, that you kind of mentioned that, um, because I do think that that's one of the differences in a product line based business um, in a product based business. And that also kind of brings me to the question of, you know, e-commerce versus traditional retail. And maybe it's it's more like wholesale retail in the stores that you're already in versus e-commerce. But can you talk about the difference, different approaches for your products um, for those different platforms? If you so will. this is what happened with me. I had a coach that knew wholesale. So she taught me wholesale. So I started with wholesale. Now I have a coach that focuses on retail. I would highly recommend to anybody to start with e-commerce, your own website and selling that way. Number one, the margins are better. And number two, it's going to give you a really quick idea of is your product worthy? Because that means somebody has to find you, go to your website and buy your widget. And so if nobody comes, nobody finds you and nobody buys, it lets you know you need to do something totally different. So um, I try now to encourage people to have a balanced approach where about half of their sales are coming from retail and the other half are coming from wholesale. We're very imbalanced right now with the bulk of our sales coming from um, selling to stores. So in 2020, we're going back and we're just gonna focus on direct to consumer. So spending a lot of time optimizing our website in terms of SEO, but I have some really different thoughts about SEO. Um, making sure how it is laid out is easy to order from. We've gotten some feedback that is not the easiest to order from. Making sure that the feel of it when you land there is the Southern inspired and Southern culture kind of thing that we want. So we're really doing a lot to push people to our website. And then we're going to use social media to to really talk to those people. So through our Facebook group, our Facebook page, our Instagram page, our, our Pinterest, it's all about speaking directly to our consumer and then driving those people to our website to buy our products. I really, really cannot stress enough that people do not need to rely on third parties to sell their stuff, Amazon, Etsy, boutiques or whatever. The power really lies in you and if you set everything up well to begin with, you can run Facebook ads, Instagram ads, and use your social media to drive people right to your website, and you have total control over your money. 
I love that. I love that point. And, you know, and I do want to ask you this of when you started this company four years ago, you know, you've talked so much about your lessons learned. And I think, you know, that's for every entrepreneur in, in this journey. And, and I'm sure there will be more in the future, but what is your, what is, what I wish I would have known before I started a company? First off, if I'd known then what I know now, I'd still be a teacher. This is the hardest. I tell anybody that come to me and be like, I want to be an entrepreneur. I say, don't do it. And if I can talk them out of doing it, then they don't need to do it. Because this is the hardest thing that I have ever had to do in my entire life. I have not, I didn't collect a check at all for the first two years. And I barely, <coughs> excuse me, collect a check now from the company. So that's the other thing, like there is this misconception that you're going to start a company and you're just going to be rolling in the dough. Even people that are rolling in the dough <coughs> company wise, they don't personally make a lot of money. So um, that's like the first thing that I would tell people, like you better have the right mindset and you better talk to some people that are for real, for real doing it. Not these internet gurus that's going to tell you how to make a, you know, a hundred thousand dollars the first month. Like don't talk to them. You talk to some product based people that are in it and grind it and talk to them. So that's the first thing, like really having a realistic expectation of um, what it is that what what does it take to build a multi-million dollar company it's one thing to have a side hustle that you just you know making a couple of thousand dollars a month you know selling you know stuff at the flea market is another thing that you want to do 30 40 50 thousand dollars a month in sales you you it's a whole nother ball game so have realistic expectations and the other thing i wish i had just trusted my gut more i felt like i didn't know what i was doing because i used to be a teacher and who am I to make these hard decisions? And now looking back, I would be so much further along and a lot of mistakes would have not been made had I just said no to a lot of things. But I didn't know what I didn't know and I thought other people could do it better than me or manage it better than me or whatever. And that is so not the case. Most people are quite capable of doing a lot of the stuff that needs to be done or they are smart enough to learn it well enough to tell somebody else to do it. But I just turned a lot of things hold hog over to people and hope that they would be able to do it better than me and wasted so much time and money um, with people that really did a way worse job than, than I would have done with my limited knowledge. Just trust in your gut and um, just trust. Yeah, just trust in your, it's your company, it's your, it's your baby. You know better than anybody else what to do with your company. Thank you so much for making that point. I love that. That's great of just, you know, having the resolve to make those decisions um, and, and being capable, right? So what's next for Southern Elegance? I know you talked about world apparel, domination. but- World domination, world domination. And I'm <laughs> not exaggerating. <laughs> like, I'm joking, but I'm not joking. Like, I'm joking, but I'm not joking. I met someone um, and she is trying to, um, we're trying to get a grant so that I can fly to China to an international um, trade show there so that I can present the brand to international buyers. So literally um, adding new products slowly over the next five years and introducing our brand to the world market, like literally world domination. And if you can, let me tell you this, six months ago, like I would have never thought that I would be in this place. But when you are ready, people will show up and help you. So the one thing that I, I cannot stress enough is that get your branding together, get your photography together, get your packaging together, and then just show up. And everything that you need, people will just say, hey, this is beautiful. Would you like to do X? And you're ready and you can just go, yeah, come on, let's go. So literally world domination. Sean, I love that. And I, I do, I want to ask you one more thing because I think world don, denom, domination is a great point to end on, um, especially for Southern Elegance. And so for our entrepreneurs that are in this group that are early stage, idea to first invoice, what is your advice for them at this stage of entrepreneurship? Don't quit. Do not quit. Do not quit. It is going to be the hardest thing that you have ever done in your entire life. Be, and I tell people it's entrepreneurship is scorched earth. 
especially if you're going from one thing to, um, you know, I was, I worked in education for 22 years. I use all of my savings. I use my um, retirement funds. So the first thing that got burned all the hell is my money and then my time and then my health. And then a whole bunch of relationships because I wasn't hanging out. I still don't watch TV because I was working so hard building a brand. If you're not willing to sacrifice almost everything, then don't do it. If you do it, though, and you get past that scorched earth, you have to remember nature sends a lightning strike to burn everything down for it to grow back fresh. On the other side, oh, man, it's beautiful. And I'm, I'm turning that corner now where I'm seeing the other side and I'm like, oh, this is going to be so well worth it. Even though I had to sacrifice a lot and anybody in it will sacrifice a lot. Once you get through it, you'll know who your true friends are. You'll know who your family is. You'll know people that you can count on. It'll build a resilience in you where you can go out into the world and be like, oh, I got this because I done been through the fire. It's like a phoenix literally rising up. So to stick with it is going to be hard, but you can do it. Well, Deshaun, thank you so much for joining us for this breakdown episode powered by Bat Life. And your energy, let me just say, is absolutely infectious. You make thank me you. really excited. Um, when I saw your pitch last year, I mean, it just makes you want to stand up and be like, yes. Um, and the power of story and connection and staying true to your brand, just to reiterate that authenticity that you were talking about. So thank you for joining us and sharing, you know, about your experience uh, of being an entrepreneur for the past four years. Thank you so much. I do appreciate it. Anytime. <laughs> we will definitely have you back in a year and see where you're at with that, Ooh, with that I new would launch. Love that. I might be <laughs> out here making it rain by the end. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> okay. It sounds good. Thank you. All right. Launch Lab Online. We will see you guys soon. Thanks again, Deshaun.